Okay, I think we are ready to start. So as I said, thank you so much for joining us today again on this uh, How to Get Published webinar. Um, today we're going to be focusing on guidance for researchers from lower income countries. And I just wanted to um, first highlight that for the first time, we're going to have translated captions on this webinar. So um, you should be able to see on your screen um, something that says show captions or something like that. Um, and you are able to select the language you'd like the captions to be translated into. So um, just play around with it. I think there's just over 20 languages included. So um, uh, we hope that is helpful. And I'm just going to very quickly introduce our panel today. Um, first, we have Jessica Offenberger, who is a publishing editor on the SAGE Journal's editorial team. She works closely with editors and societies to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to help navigate the publishing process and develop key strategies. Next, we have Rishi Chauham, who has uh, over 18 years of experience working in the field of higher education and open research as a business lead and marketing head. She is currently the global head of marketing at Cactus Communications, looking over leading research solutions for global markets, including Americas, EMEA, and Asia. Prior to joining Cactus, she has worked with uh, the Taylor and Francis Group, uh, Walters Kluwer, and the Confederation of Indian Industry. At her previous organization, she worked on understanding and delivering on research, researcher needs in the lower income countries from South Asia and Sub-Saharan African region. Samantha Crown is an associate publishing editor in the Open Access team. She manages the editorial development of open access journals within the science, technical and medical disciplines. Before coming to SAGE, she was a full-time university lecturer specializing in environmental and media communication. And lastly, uh, there's me, Maria Tissot. I am marketing manager in the author marketing team at SAGE, and my work is focused on helping early career researchers get published. During the webinar today, you can send your questions uh, using the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, we will have around 20 minutes at the end of the session to answer them. Um, but if we are unable to answer all questions, we will follow up with, uh, with you individually by email. So don't worry if you don't get your uh, question answered during the webinar today. And I'm going to now hand it over to Jessica, who will start the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Maria, and welcome everyone to another How to Get Published webinar. We're really excited to be here today. So as Maria mentioned, our focus is on guidance for researchers from lower income countries. So we're going to be covering bits and pieces of the entire publishing process throughout today's webinar. To get started, one of the, the key components of getting published is finding what research has already been published and understanding what is already in the literature. So while open access is growing, a large amount of published content is published in subscription journals. Articles in subscription journals are typically available with access through an institution or individual subscription to the journal. That doesn't always mean that it's easy to find and access those articles. I know I've heard that from, from several uh, of you attendees over the, the past year through which we've been running this webinar series. So I wanted to provide a few tips to access the research you need in an ethical way when you encounter paywalls. So the first, the first tip is to identify which articles you have access to. For SAGE in particular, the SAGE Journal's website offers you the ability to filter content to which you have access, whether it's uh, granted via your institution, your organization, or maybe a society that you're a member of or that you belong to. The results will also include content that is free to read, perhaps published under a CCBY license, which uh, Samantha will cover later in our, our presentation today. So when you're on the Sage Journal's website in particular, if you click Advanced Search, at the bottom of the search landing page, you'll see the ability to select only content to which you have full access. So that's a great way to, to start your search, at least on the Sage Journal's website. 
This one sounds obvious, uh, but double check that your library or institution does not have access. So when many researchers discover content outside the library portal and the library search engine, uh, they often encounter the difficulty using the right credentials. So for instance, you might find an article on Google Scholar, and when you try to use your institution's credentials there, it might say your library does not have access. But sometimes a library does have access. It's just that they have subscribed via a third party aggregator like Ovid, EBSCO, and JSTOR. So publishers like Sage also partner with Google Casa to help streamline this off campus library access. Uh, there's plugins like Lean Library, a Sage publishing company, that have all this behind the scenes detail, and then you can save the PDF immediately. So Sometimes it just might be the way you're searching for and accessing the libraries and you might need to go back through your uh, library aggregator. You might also ask a, your librarian if they have uh, if they can arrange an interlibrary loan or ILL with another library that does have access to the article. Librarians sometimes have resources in place to facilitate this arrangement. So that's a great way. Really, your librarian at your or university, organization, institution are great resources and a great place to start, um, especially when looking for access. It's also great to have them answer questions on how to publish manuscripts. So while we have these webinars as a great tool, uh, your librarian is a great resource. We've, we really value our partnerships with librarians. Another option is if you know someone who has access to the content. So if the content is in a Sage journal, there's a feature that's, that has the share functionality or the share feature. So you could ask your contact with authorized access through either a society or an institution to use the share button feature on the Sage Journals platform. So this helps provide an easy and ethical option for non-subscribers to access articles. So uh, of course, for you also sharing your own content on the from the Sage Journals platform. Uh, so the link that you send through the Sage, sorry, the share functionality will provide you with either 30 or 90 days free access, this depends on the journal, to the EPUB format of the journal article as well as the HTML version. And so each link can be used in a limited number of times during that valid period. So this is a great tool. You can even contact the, the corresponding author to have them share uh, access to that article. You can also see if the author or authors are on social media. Authors will often publicize their work and share free to access copies because just like you, you want your research to be accessed read and cited. So you can search social media platforms such as Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook to see if the author has a public profile so you can get in touch and interact with them. Uh, also look for open access articles. So publishing open access under a Creative Commons license allows authors to retain the copyright on their work while allowing others to distribute, copy, and make uses of that article or work. Uh, so look for that CC license, uh, CCBY, what have you, uh, is that will make sure that it's free to read and it, you're able to download that article. We also recommend uh, browsing PubMed. Uh, so PubMed Central uh, will have the full text available. Uh, so many journals are at open access particular or some subscription journals are published in PubMed Central. So you can see if that full text version is indexed. Um, other journals al allow the author accepted manuscript uh, to be published on PubMed Central. So for instance, uh, certain government funders will require that, and then this can be uploaded to PubMed Central, and that will make sure that it's free to read. And this applies mostly to the STEM fields, uh, but of course it can cross disciplines as well. Uh, take a look at repositories. So check your 
institutional repository or other institutional repositories, uh, maybe one that's relevant in your field. Many authors can upload the accepted version of their manuscript to these type of repositories. Uh, and this could be at the in institution's mandate. This could be your own discretion, something that you want to do for others. Um, if you, for, for those that publish within a SAGE title, um, if you're an author of a paper accepted to a SAGE published journal, you can upload the original before peer review or accepted version of your manuscript to the institutional repository. Um, SAGE has really been an early supporter of, of Green OA. This is what Green OA is. So Green OA refers to the final archiving, to the archiving of the final accepted version of the manuscript before it has been typeset for the production process. Um, Sage is one of the only major publishers that uh, allow authors to post the accepted version of the article with no embargo. There's also preprint servers like Sage's Advanced preprint server that allows you to post your paper as well. Um, preprint servers, just worth noting, are the original version of the article and are not peer reviewed. So that's something you'll want to note as you're going through your reference search and going and making your citations, noting the final published articles and any preprints. That will be something you want to distinguish in your reference search. We'll be covering that in uh, one of the webinars next year. So I talked about this already. It's worth noting that institutions provide access to journals to which it subscribes. So when you search via a library catalog or directly on a publisher's website, you see content to which you have access. Authentic authentication occurs in a variety of ways, for instance, via IP address um, or Open Athens. So your institution may have you log in to a secure page on their website, and then you'll be redirected to the publisher's journal page or via a referral URL. Uh, sometimes institutions will allow you to connect a personal account to the institution's holding. Uh, for an extended period of time, maybe for two or three months. So this helps improve remote options. I know a lot of us are working remotely around the world and uh, traveling for different research collaborations. So uh, you might need to be signed into your institution website to gain access to content on a publisher's website. You might also be a member of an association that owns or is, is affiliated with a particular journal, and that society might provide access to a journal as a benefit of membership. If it's a society to which you do not belong, um, and then maybe it's relevant for you, uh, this, this article that you want to gain access to, uh, Perhaps you could join and be a member. They might have discounts for uh, members from different parts of the world, uh, or maybe they're able to provide you with that article, like that share, going back to that share feature, uh, just for a limited time to open it up for you to read. Um, if there's an association that is not affiliated with a journal and maybe it's relevant in the field, you could reach out to that association or to Sage or uh, another publisher and say, this would be a really good fit and maybe you could offer this as a benefit of membership. So if you're part of that uh, society already, then maybe there's a partnership that can be established to offer that to your fellow society members or association members if there's a there's a lot of relevant content to that, that association or that discipline. And then uh, there's repository sites like Academia and ResearchGate. These are good avenues uh, to browse for research in your subject area. So you can look through uh, the profiles of researchers in your field, as well as search by subject area. So there's a great number of tools out there to be able to read and access ethnically the content that you are looking for when working on your own research projects or conducting literature reviews. Uh, finally, there's always uh, paying for access, whether that's an ind ind individual subscription, maybe paying just for that particular article. Um, perhaps there's, uh, you can build that into your grant funding, or maybe your institution has uh, a small pot available for uh, 
purchases, one-off purchases like that. Uh, but there's a lot of great tools here. We'll be circulating a blog post on this uh, on how to read and access these full text articles that you might be looking for. We do want to highlight uh, Research for Life. This is an organization that SAGE partners with. Uh, Research for Life is designed to enhance the scholarship, teaching, research, and policymaking of many thousands of students, faculty, and scientists in the developing world who are working in health, agriculture, uh, and other life, physical, and social sciences. So universities and college research institutions, many professional schools, extension centers, government sites are able to access research for life resources. So SAGE, as well as many other publishers, partner with Research for Life to provide access to institutions and research researchers around the world. You may already be receiving uh, access to journal content through Research for Life. So the list of how you get access is based on four factors, including gross national income or GNI, uh, GNI per capita, the United Nations least developed countries list inclusion, and human development index. So if you're from one of these countries highlighted, your institution is eligible for access. Um, Maria will also be circulating uh, the Research for Life website, which will be in the PowerPoint slide as well, where you can see that eligibility between Group A and Group B. Uh, so that, that's either uh, free access or uh, discounted access, which is uh, very important. And, and we want to make sure that everyone can get access to journal content. So um, how will you get access to Research for Life? So each institution has one user ID and password. Uh, and so you might already be granted, your institution will probably already have access if they're a partner with Research for Life. Um, most likely you will be getting that via your campus network, which is an IP-based login uh, inside your institution's network grants. So they grant that convenient access for you if your institution has this enabled. Um, if not, it will be via that username and password and your librarian or your uh, director's office will have access to that. And they've probably communicated that to you on how to access it if they haven't already. Um, if you're not quite sure, you can reach out to your librarian uh, to get more information on the best way to access uh, journal content through Research for Life. Over to you, Samantha. Thank you. Okay. Um, so right now we're going to talk about manuscript writing and publication tips. And again, any questions, please just um, feel free to ask and we will get to those um, a little bit later. So authors should use an academic writing style. So what do I mean by this? Well, for one, authors should write in a consistent person and tense appropriate for their field. You also wanna be as specific as possible and avoid generaliza generalization um, whenever possible. Try also to avoid any sort of regional or discipline specific jargon. Um, that's really important just because not everyone is necessarily going to be um, familiar with that. And then also keep in mind, as Research for Life mentioned in their strategies for effective writing course, write to communicate. Don't write to impress. I think that's a really important thing to consider. Um, Okay, so with all of this in mind, some general improvements on language quality are also really appreciated. So you wanna choose your terminology and nomenclature carefully. So what are some specific aspects to consider? You want to choose active voice over passive voice, use concise language, simpler sentence construction is always welcomed. Um, correct article use, and then also you want to avoid um, singular plural agreement of verbs and nouns. So just lots of sort of writing tips in that capacity. Just keep that in mind. Um, in terms of the article, the article should be cohesive and consistent in its overall organization and flow within the manuscript. And 
Within the manuscript itself, you also want to use a balance of tools such as transitions and parallel construction. The research questions and findings should also be really clearly stated and make sure to use correct headers because they really help organize the document. Um, other things to keep in mind, journals really expect bias-free, inclusive language that is appropriate for a global audience. So authors need to take care when writing about gender, age, disability, neurodiversity, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and religion. Authors want to be sensitive to labels and appropriately specific. So authors need to keep in mind that people can have many identities and one shared identity does not necessarily mean shared experiences. It's also worth noting here that bias-free inclusive research goes beyond word choice and extends to the assumptions made by the researchers and the intention and design of the study itself. So for example, consider sampling. One um, resource that's really good to keep in mind, APA has some really great um, resources available on their site and the links are actually gonna be available in the slide deck that's gonna be posted. Um, so certainly check out that website and um, utilize those resources. And then when the manuscript um, has been submitted, if the reviewer or reviewers have any concerns with any of what we've just gone over within the manuscript, it will or should be noted in the review. Also, keep in mind, having an academic writing style is not intuitive. It can be challenging and even daunting, especially when you're starting out. And also when, especially when English, English is not your first language. Um, or when you're working to improve your overall writing skills. So one thing that we really encourage is for you to use any services that are available through um, either your publisher or your institution. So for example, you could use uh, language editing services um, or have an author or pardon me, an editor uh, help you uh, with the overall language quality and writing style. Sage actually offers Sage author services uh, to help with language editing and formatting. So something to keep in mind. And then one common piece of advice by experts to new scientific writers is practice, practice, practice. It makes you better in writing. Okay, so we've talked about some overall things to keep in mind when it comes to writing. Let's now talk about reporting guidelines. Um, so first off, review the reporting guidelines by study type on the Equator Network website and make sure that your article follows the items uh, listed in the reporting guidelines. This is really important. Um, depending on the journal, it might not be a requirement that all articles make a significant or especially novel contribution to the field. Um, but at a minimum, the journal does expect um, it to be clear what the contribution of the research is. Um, and the reason that that's important is because future research really needs to be able to build on um, the existing study. And when there's a lack of clear findings or we're not including the limitation in the study, it can be really hard um, to, to do that. So next, let's talk about what we expect um, when it comes to research and how we're tying it to um, the existing literature. So the literature review. Um, that is what builds out the theoretical framework that you're going to be um, either discussing or expanding on in, in the study. And the literature review, that section, it details the kind of work that's already been done in the field or, and or discusses similar studies. So within the literature review, um, you're going to want to summarize the theories that you are applying to your research and connect the theories to lay the groundwork for your study. 
So typically in a literature review, you're not introducing any new information about your own study, but you're weaving together the information from prior research and prior studies that shows how your research and your study's design and methodology is grounded in the existing theory. The most important thing is that you show how your investigation builds upon and contributes to the existing scholarly work and theoretical development. So, you know, that's a lot to take in, but editors and reviewers expect to see a theory or theories um, presented in the literature review that's going to support the rationale for the investigation. And most editors and reviewers expect to see a pretty concise and targeted literature review, as well as an explanation um, of why the uh, relevant, re relevant theories um, sort of apply or uphold your research question or speak to the intervention um, approach. So one thing to keep in mind, neglecting to include a theory could be taken as an indication that the research question is relatively ungrounded or perhaps even speculative. Um, so the introduction is not the place to offer a primer on the theory being used, but editors and reviewers would expect that you give a brief summary of the theory that relates to your study, as well as a few chosen references that direct the reader to um, what they can expect uh, to learn more of. Um, so again, editors do expect to see theories presented in the literature review and sort of as a rationale for the investigation. Um, they then expect you to return to those theories in your overall discussion section, as well as in the conclusion and how those theories could apply um, in terms of next steps or next section. Um, Couple other things to keep in mind. You wanna make sure that your figures are easy to read and clearly labeled. Um, a figure legend should be detailed enough to explain um, the figure so that a reader does not need to immediately refer to the results section for additional information. And then lastly, a common critique um, does have to do with um, figure legends and Journals really appreciate when all of these are uh, really detailed and clear and presented um, according to the, to the uh, submission guidelines. Okay, so I think we're gonna move on to the methods and analysis section. So at this point, I think it makes sense to talk about the study design. Some questions to consider as we're about to go into this um, discussion and kind of take it back to um, your own work or what you're gonna be sort of considering when deciding on um, the methodology and the design of the study. So first and foremost, seemingly obvious, but it's not. Ask yourself, is the study design common for this type of study being conducted? Is the methodology commonly used within your field? Is the methodology appropriate for the research question that's being addressed? So if they are novel to the field, um, you might need to include a little bit of an additional explanation as to why the methods were chosen or why they're being used. Also consider the question, do the materials and methods section um, describe and describe in detail the procedure that is being followed. Um, does the section include critical steps that are unique to the study? So for example, does it include details such as dilutions of antibodies used as well as catalog um, of numbers and company names and uh, specific details regarding the equipment used? Are, the statistical techniques relevant to the study. Are they standard for any um, for that particular kind of study? And it's really important that that's included in the discussion so that future studies, um, for one, can build off of what you've contributed um, 
in your study and they have all of the relevant information. Okay. Um, and again, we can come back to any questions or specifics um, with that later on, but I think we should turn over to um, the ethics discussion and talk about that a little bit more. Um, so we um, have talked a little bit about reviewer ethics um, and we can certainly talk um, more about that. But with this discussion right now, I think it makes sense to talk about uh, the ethical guidelines you should follow when performing the study and writing the actual article. So reviewers are going to look for how and when informed consent was obtained and or who gave ethical approval. That's really important to make sure that you include. Um, the reviewer is also going to be looking for any sort of data or image manipulation. So what do I mean by that? An example would be if a p-value is just too perfect um, or a standard error um, or standard error bars that are too consistent. Those are things that um, reviewers are going to be uh, kind of looking for. So it's really important that um, all of those are uh, areas that are considered and addressed before um, submitting. And I'm going to uh, turn everything back over to uh, Jessica right now. Great. Thank you, Samantha. There's a lot of great information here. Uh, there's a lot to the publishing process from from accessing the right research and, and finding out how to publishing. So before we before we continue forward, I wanted to focus on one other um, aspect you might want to consider including in your manuscript. So Samantha, thank you for covering everything from uh, how to write the manuscript, providing that overview, resources available. There's one other thing. You might want to include a plain language summary. A plain language summary, or PLS, uh, sits right after the academic abstract. So a PLS consists of a plain language title and a clear summary of the article after uh, using non-technical language. So this makes it even more accessible to a wider network of readers. So many many Sage journals and, and other publishers now accept plain language summaries. And some have made them mandatory for all submissions with an academic abstract. So as you're probably aware, some article types do not require an abstract. But there are many article types, including original research, uh, that will require an academic abstract. And this is a great addition to add the plain language summary. These are written by you, the article authors. And as you might already be aware, the abstract and the plain language summary are completely free to read. So this means they're not they're not behind a paywall and they're available for anyone to read and access. So as you're trying to decide which articles to cite in your literature or see what's out there, the abstract and the plain language summary will be available to you regardless if the article is made open access. This is great for uh, disseminating articles across social media and sharing with relevant organizations uh, to increase awareness amongst those who are interested in that research topic. So if you choose to write a plain language summary, which I think you should, this really helps tie into uh, your own research. Think carefully about your intended audience. Consider why your research should matter to them, what details may need to be expanded upon so the reader can understand what research was carried out and what the findings mean. So it's just as important to consider what does not need to be included. So what is not necessary for the reader to know for them to understand your research, uh, just as it is to consider what should be included. Be certain to ask yourself, is this necessary information and when writing your PLS? You'll also want to make sure it's balanced and accurate, avoiding speculation, exaggeration, or personal opinions. This can also be applied to your article, uh, just as you're writing your own manuscript. And then do not assume that readers have prior knowledge on the topic. So while we are all looking for a journal that's the best fit and home for our research, 
you still don't want to go in assuming that uh, the readers have prior knowledge of that topic. Writing the PLS requires a different set of skills than producing a scholarly article. You'll want to use short, concise sentences, simplify terms and avoid jargons and acronyms. Write in an active voice, but avoid superlatives and metaphors if possible. And do not merely swap out jargon for simplified terms uh, that, that PLS will be distinctly different than your abstract. So order an, in order to make sure to accurately convey the message of your research in plain language. So you'll hear a lot of the same tips from Samantha in writing your manuscript as you do in your plain language summary, but this, this PLS is even more non-technical. Um, if you're presenting your data in the PLS, avoid complicated statistics or non-essential numbers, use whole numbers, displayed as absolute numbers, percentages, or natural frequencies. For example, one out of 10 people. Don't expect your readers at this point in the plain language summary to do any calculations. And then have a member or colleague or co-author, or someone in your target audience, read your plain language summary and explain it back to you. So using their feedback will really help ensure the reader fully understands the article. A lot of these same tips can be applied to your manuscript, although in a slightly different way, utilizing mentors, colleagues, co-authors, even paid for services. You might have discounts through your organization or your grant funding to gather that feedback, whether it's the plain language summary or your manuscript. As you're going through this, this is for your manuscript, your research question, your plain language summary, we really want to ask yourself, what is the research question you are exploring? What are your hypotheses or hypotheses or expectations prior to conducting the study? What do you hope to find out? And why, why are you studying this specific research question? Why does the research matter? Uh, so many times we'll see a great cover letter that explains this information, but then uh, you'll actually read the manuscript and you'll say, wait, this isn't included in the manuscript. So as you're thinking about these questions, be sure they're addressed not only in your manuscript, but in your cover letter. And there's some, some crossover there. Uh, you'll be thinking about how broad is the topic, who is impacted by this research, as Samantha Messer. Uh, mentioned, what is your research design? Why is it the best method for exploring this issue? What are the key variables? Who are the participants involved in your research? What did you find out? Was it what you expected or not? Why should we care about these results? What are the implications of these results? And what is the key message you wish to convey? So oftentimes we'll hear Authors receive rejections because maybe it's out of scope or, or it, it, but one thing to think about if it's an international journal to which you're submitting, is your research applicable to an international audience? So it can still be a regional study. It can still be localized, but then make sure to tie that in, tie in your manuscript text and, and, and say, this is why it's important to an international audience or to the journal's readership. So as you're looking for a journal to submit to, think about how you're tailoring your manuscript to that readership and make sure it can be applied. So you can still receive a successful acceptance um, if you're publishing regional research, but just make sure to tie that into that, that global audience, that global question, why does the research matter? Um, what are the implications of these results among other things? Over to you, Samantha. Great, thank you. Those were um, excellent questions uh, to consider and ask ourselves as we're going through this process. Um, so the next process that we want to uh, think about is choosing a journal that we are going to submit to. And that can be a big decision. Um, and it's one, uh, area that you really want to do your homework in. So, you know, we might want to publish in nature or science, but 
first, we really need to ask ourselves, what is the best home for this paper? Um, and how do we figure this out? Well, there's a bunch of things that we can consider in, in making that uh, decision. So one thing that I think is really helpful is, does your article that you're working on, does it reference any publications um, repeatedly? That might be a good indication that that publication um, is a good fit for your research. Um, another thing to ask yourself, does your paper fit in with the aims and scope of a journal that you are considering? Is there another journal perhaps where the aims and scope um, really align with what your uh, paper is, is discussing and researching? Um, also, think about what types of papers the journal publishes. Um, what are the methodologies and study designs sort of commonly used within um, the journal? Is there sort of a significance to um, the majority of the papers are using specific designs or so, so forth? Um, ask yourself also, you know, what type of paper is this specifically? And what do I mean by that? So. Is it an empirical research paper? Is it a review paper? Is it a brief report? Is it a book review? Um, not every journal is necessarily going to publish those types of papers. And some publish, some journals will publish them more than others. So that's something to really consider when you're exploring um, which journal to submit to. And then a couple of the things to keep in mind. Um, one thing is, as you're exploring journals, ask yourself, you know, what is the journal's reputation? What, um, what do I think of this journal? What do our peers think about this journal? Um, do you know anyone who has published in the journal? Also, take a look and check out, you know, who's on the editorial board? Who um, is the editor? Do they work within your field? Um, also, other questions to ask yourself, you know, is the editorial board diverse? Are they highly um, cited in your field? Also, things to really sort of make sure that we're um, talking about and taking a look at is what is the journal, um, what is the state of uh, turnaround time? What is the current rejection rate? Um, what is the peer review policy? Um, those are some things that you really wanna make sure that you take a look at. Also, um, what is the readership of the journal? Is it a subscription journal? Is it an open access journal? Does that um, matter to you? So in other words, maybe having um, a journal published in open access is something that you want to look at um, because of you know, the study and the design and the findings, and you just think that that might be a good fit. Also, other things to think about is, um, does your institution have any restrictions on where you submit articles um, or where those articles are, are ultimately published? So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, does your institution require that the journal has an impact factor or a certain license? Um, does the journal, um, you're looking at provide any sort of open access option. Is that something that is a requirement in terms of the funding or in your um, institutional requirements? So these are some of the things that you would wanna think about. Also, we wanna talk about, um, it's really important to be on the lookout for predatory publishers. Um, and what I mean by that is journals who don't do proper peer review. Um, these are, these are on the rise. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to avoid those journals, but very briefly, um, you wanna make sure that the journal is uh, indexed in certain um, areas, such as like, for example, PubMed. Um, and you wanna also just take a look through their publication policies. SAGE actually offers two different services for authors that can help, um, figure out you that can help you figure out which um, journal might be a good fit and those services are sage path and our journal finder um, and you can see the details uh, on the slide so again any questions about that we're happy to um, talk more about it um, and yeah i think 
for right now, we're going to probably move on to preparing your paper for um, submission. So when it comes to um, preparing for a submission, for submission, um, and you've decided which journal you want to submit to, this next step is really important. You want to check out the manuscript submission guidelines for that particular journal. Um, these can be very different depending on the journal. And it's really important that you follow the specific submission guidelines for that particular journal. I cannot emphasize how much editors, editors just really appreciate um, the effort that is put into following um, those guidelines. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the other thing that you might wanna think about is that when we're not completely following the guidelines, there's a little bit of a uh, larger chance that your paper might be unsubmitted and sent back so that those adjustments can be made before they um, even consider the, the content of the paper itself. And that can just sort of prolong the overall process. Um, one thing to, to think about doing also is looking at the articles from the journal itself for a reference in terms of the formatting, the structure, the writing style. Um, that can be really helpful. And then as you're getting ready to submit, just like you did with the writing itself, um, make every effort to improve the overall quality of the manuscript. And try to be really objective about um, your own work. So ask yourself, you know, are you writing for the journal's particular, particular audience? Uh, is the paper itself within the aims and scope? Have I tailored the manuscript um, accordingly? And then just little details, make sure that you're checking to include um, the, any information in terms of submission funding, any information that's required about conflict of interest or ethical statements. Um, that's even if you have nothing to address, you probably are gonna need to include something along those lines. Um, also think about if it would be helpful um, to create a visual or graphical abstract to help in the promotion and understanding of your findings. Um, for a public audience. And then this is another thing that I really wanna um, stress. If you have any questions or if there's any doubt about the process or if you have questions, reach out to the journal's editorial office for any advice and feel free to ask if the manuscript that you're working on is a good fit. You could even send over an abstract or a brief outline. And that is really helpful in terms of um, an editor being able to tell you whether or not uh, it's a good fit. So next, you're getting close, you're getting close. Um, so let's talk about the submission checklist. As we've been mentioning, um, the submission guidelines will tell you what the editor wants included, as well as any relevant information about how to structure the text, um, how to use headings appropriately and present the material. But and I love a checklist, these guidelines um, are ones that you kind of just wanna go through and make sure that you can literally check off um, the following. And again, some of these may seem obvious, but uh, talk from experience, it is worth, uh, it is worth going through and making sure because you always find something. Um, so just to go over a few of these, you know, and I used to tell my students, um, make sure you're using the appropriate margins. Um, if there's any specifications in that capacity, that will be de detailed on the submission guidelines page. Um, make sure the font is the appropriate um, size and style and color. Um, also make sure that the study itself has complied with any and all ethical guidelines. Uh, that's gonna be detailed, um, at least for SAGE, on the uh, submission guidelines page. Spacing, is my paper 1.5? Is it double spaced? Is the uh, journal requiring a certain um, format in that capacity? Have I included um, clear headers that match um, the articles um, of the journal? So in other words, are the formats aligning? What reference style is required um, by the journal? There's different reference styles. Um, and 
each journal will specify what reference styles they um, require for their articles. So for example, APA, Vancouver, MLA, um, so on and so forth. Have I stayed within the word limit? There's usually a little bit of leeway here, but you really wanna make sure you stay within the limit whenever possible. That's really important. Um, and then also check to make sure that you formatted your article uh, correctly. So look at the tables, look at the figures. Is everything formatted the way that it's supposed to be? Also, make sure there's no identifying features um, in the manuscript if the journal has um, an anonymous peer review policy. That's really uh, something to, to take a look at. Um, oh, the other thing that you really want to make sure you keep in mind is make sure that your affiliation um, information is accurate. So in other words, if you um, changed affiliations or if you uh, were a student and you've since left your institution or graduated um, and you're submitting a paper, you want to make sure that the institutional information you list with that manuscript aligns with where you were when that research was carried out. Um, so in other words, if you were a student at an institution when you were doing that research, that's what should be um, listed on that particular manuscript, even if you've moved to a different institution. Um, also ask yourself um, or check out if the journal accepts preprints. And then also, if you are submitting a conference paper, double check, um, because sometimes published conference papers are covered, are covered by copyright um, and will only be counted as a new submission if there is uh, sufficient and sufficient new information um, or material included. Um, again, if you have any questions, check out the submission guidelines page. Um, feel free to reach out to the editorial office um, if you have any questions. And then do, you know, the proofreading, um, make sure you've provided a cover letter, anything that the journal requires, um, make sure that you have provided all of that um, and like Jessica said, it's really important to include all of that uh, relevant information uh, within the cover letter itself. Um, talk about why or discuss why the uh, editor should consider your paper. How does it align with the aims and scope of the journal? Um, really just how does, how does your paper um, or address why your paper would be such a good fit for that particular uh, journal, and that can go a long way to having your paper uh, be considered by the editor. Okay, so common mistakes to avoid. Um, well, the first one is not thoroughly reviewing the submission guidelines. Um, it's a big one. Um, incorrect formatting of tables and figures, that's another uh, really important thing to think about. Um, also, and I know, again, you know, it might seem like, huh, how does that work? But if you're submitting your manuscript to a journal where the paper is just really not the right fit, it doesn't really meet the aims and scope of uh, the journal, or if your paper has um, the wrong manuscript type, if there's um, some issues in terms of grammar and syntax, there's lots of little things that can um, be avoided if you know you're going through and doing um, and checking all of the checklists and making sure that everything aligns with the submission guidelines. Um, another really big thing to consider is you want to avoid any possible plagiarism. Um, so cite you know and include any references um, in the reference style that is uh, required by the journal. Even, for example, if you don't use words verbatim, um, if you're just paraphrasing, you, you need to include the citation. Um, where did you get this information from? Um, include that. It's really helpful for future um, readers of your work to know where you got this information from. It's important for you know, lots of different reasons. Um, but when in doubt, cite your sources. And 
with that, I am going to um, turn it back over to Jessica. Yes, so we'll, we'll be addressing some of the questions that you've had because we only have about five minutes left. Um, so with author aid, I just wanted to highlight this resource here that author aid is a great tool for you to tap into. It's a global network that provides support, mentoring, resources, and training for researchers in low and middle income countries. So they offer personal mentoring uh, by how they published researchers and professional editors and pairing them up with those looking for mentoring. There's online training workshops and scientific writing. Uh, they also share these webinars there. Um, there's discussion groups where you can post uh, questions and you receive answers. You can benefit from advice and insights from members across the globe. Like I said, there's a range of documents and resources on best practices in writing and publication, and there's a chance to offer and collaborate with other researchers. Um, over 2,300 people participate in that discussion group, so that has a great forum. All of their resources are free of charge, uh, and there are resources available in Arabic, Chinese, French, and Spanish uh, as well. Uh, these links will all be circulated. And then uh, the mentoring relationships, I just wanted to mention those can be short or long-term. We have a great session from last year on mentorships. Uh, so this is a great way to find help and advice for, for you that might be looking for some additional guidance and that your institution may not offer. Um, wanted to mention that there's two grants. There's travel grants and workshop grants. So be sure to look into those for those of you that may not have funding through your institution or organization. Uh, there are grants available to you so that you can possibly attend to uh, different workshops or conferences around the world. Um, and then there's also specific skill workshops at various institutions and universities. Um, so be sure to take a look at that. There's a great community. And then uh, wanted to really emphasize this. Um, if you do, if you are looking for a mentor, whether that's a colleague, a co-author, uh, someone halfway across the world, um, you want to look for those who are in your area of specialization and clarify your needs. So be upfront with what you're looking for. Um, these mentors will be able to provide that for you, but you have to be clear on what you're looking for, whether that's um, guidance on the publishing process or something else. There's also those professional societies and discussion groups that really serve your specialization to locate and connect with research partnerships um, and also for co-collaboration across uh, different fields. And then uh, there's also sometimes they offer grants and uh, scholarships to be able to travel to conferences uh, that may not be in your home country. So be sure to look into those. Want to quickly highlight here the differences between uh, subscription and open access models. Uh, many of you are asking where, what are the free options available to you as an author? So in a, tr a traditional subscription, journal or a hybrid journal. Uh, there is no cost to publish in that type of journal. This will be clearly outlined in the author guidelines. Um, and then in an open access model, uh, there is an article processing charge or APC. This again will be clearly outlined in the author guidelines. And if you're from a Research for Life country, you might be eligible for a discount or waiver. We also have a number of open access sales deals or OASDs where the corresponding author might be eligible for a discount or waiver uh, in either publishing open access in that traditional subscription journal or uh, in a gold open access model. So uh, be sure to look at your institution and your consortia deals. You might want to change the corresponding author to uh, update that accordingly. And then if you're an editorial board member, you might be eligible for a discount in some of our gold open access journals publishing uh, the 
open access with that APC, you might be eligible for discounts through your society as well if you're an affiliated society member for a society owned title. So there are lots of great options. Um, and if a funder or institution is mandating open access, um, oftentimes that will be built into the grant funding uh, or there will be an open access sales deal or you might be part of research for life. So remember, there's always that free option. There are many traditional subscription journals out there where you can publish at no cost. And then uh, you are also eligible for discounts and waivers here. Just a reminder, uh, if you do publish in a traditional subscription journal, you uh, have the ability to post the original or accepted manuscript at any time in any format without embargo, and the final published PDF has limitations. This will be circulated to you. Um, be sure to go through and watch our webinar library of all the great topics we've covered so far. And our next, join our next uh, webinar in August on conferences. We're also going to be talking about the grants and scholarships that you can be awarded to travel and connect and network with possible mentors and co-authors. Um, there, hope we've addressed some of the questions that have come in. Due to time, we'll be following up with each of you to make sure we get your questions. And uh, before we log off, Rishi, is there anything you would like to say or add uh, just to, to round out the discussion here? Thank you, Jessica and Samantha. I think it was really a great presentation from both of you and you covered a lot of points. I think, first of all, I think throughout my publishing career, I've interacted with researchers from low income settings. And one thing I really admire about researchers from um, this uh, geography is that they're really passionate, they're driven, right? Uh, so I would uh, really encourage all of researchers to don't get disheartened because you know everything is part of learning so you don't feel disheartened in terms of tips i think there are four tips which i really want to share with the researchers number one i always recommend researchers from low income settings to publish an open access journal the reason is very simple because it's uh, people can researchers can read more reading means more views more shareability and it even it can have more citations right so it will bring your research a good number of views and readership. So please do try to publish open access without thinking that APC is expensive. There are various ways which uh, Samantha and both Jessica has covered. And also there are various funders, institutions which actually support. Uh, there are also waivers available. So please do explore it before just rejecting thinking that APC is high. And from my publishing experience, one thing I can tell you, or many times researchers from low income settings write to the journal editors. And if they are able to communicate to the journal editors that how their research will contribute objectively to the subject area and to the knowledge for the larger good, editors do consider. So don't hesitate even in writing to the journal editors if you feel your research deserves to be published in a particular journal. So that's number one tip. The second one I always tell researchers is to collaborate, right? There are various collaboration platforms. There are traditional ways you can collaborate within the institution, through conference, um, through many other ways. And now there is also a social media boom. So you can actually find a lot of researchers with the same thinking subject areas online as well. So don't hesitate in contacting them and think of collaborative projects. Collaboration is the most important part of showcasing your research and working across geography and just not from the regional perspective. That's the second one which I wanted to give. And the third one is basically more light. Uh, I think a lot of time, a lot of researchers ask these questions to all the publishers, societies, editors, where do I publish my research into, right? There were some very good points covered by Samantha and Jessica there. But one thing which I've learned is when you're doing your research and you're doing the literature reviews, which are the journals you are reading to build that literature reviews? Which are the journals you are going back again and again when you're writing your manuscript? I think that should be your top shortlist because automatically it fits into the aims and scope of that particular journal. 
but definitely you should look for other parameters because most of the journals now have all the metrics online including the first day first the season timeline right so look at the acceptance rate first season timeline the metrics but i think the one which you're reading to do your research do uh, these are the one i would say the top short list from there and fourth but not the least uh, we all understand that english is not our first language including me okay and so don't be shy about seeking help right some sage has some great services to support the searches plus you can also reach out to your peer network to get some help uh, there was a question about ai editing tools also there are academic ai editing tools now available so do look for options um, and there are also translation tools so i know a lot of researchers from countries where they think and write in their own language and then translate right so there are also translation tools available but there are a lot of help and not everything is free for sure so think of options you have to do a bit more research but there are options available and don't hesitate in asking help ever from anyone including publisher journals editors collaborators researchers around the world um, it it actually increases your chances a lot more so yeah that's it um, and i'm looking forward to questions for the Thank you so much, uh, Rishi. I think that last point about you know asking for help is such a such a great point, and uh, you know this is why we are trying to do to do these webinars as a as a way to give people a chance to ask the questions. And I realize that we've actually gone over time today, so uh, we will have to answer the questions by email. Um, I will. Uh, we're also going to collect um, as many questions as we have, and we'll try to add, uh, to answer them as a blog post as well, so everyone then can access it, and we'll, we'll send you the link when that's done as well, so look out for that, and we'll send slides and, and, and the recording and a certificate of attendance as well for everyone who participated, so thank you so much for, for coming today, and we Hope to see you in August.